Um, so what I want to do um, is tell you about some re recent progress in understanding a type of turbulence that we call geostrophic turbulence and uh, the equations that we use to describe it. And then I want to show you that uh, this state of geostrophic turbulence is itself unstable to the formation of large-scale barotropic vortices. So this is work done with my colleagues, uh, uh, mostly in uh, Boulder in Colorado. Uh, uh, Keith Julian is my uh, co-PI on this project. And uh, uh, this is the motivation for our work. Uh, so uh, we're interested in studying uh, large-scale structures um, in, the, uh, in the Earth. So this is the standard kind of uh, problem that is described by the equations of uh, quasi-geostrophy that we heard about in the previous talk. Uh, so here is the eastern seaboard of the United States. Here is the Gulf Stream, and you can see the Gulf Stream forms these large meanders. Uh, the important thing about uh, these structures is that they are of a sufficiently large scale so that if you define the Rossby number, that's going to be the important parameter in this talk, the ratio of the characteristic velocity divided by the local rotation rate times the horizontal length scale, like the diameter of one of these uh, meanders, uh, that Rossby number is actually small compared to one. So what that means is that these structures, uh, because they have a large scale, are strongly affected by rotation. Uh, stratification can also be important. That's measured by uh, something called the fruit number, is the ratio of the same characteristic velocity divided by the brunt by frequency, that's the oscillation frequency in, the, in a stratified atmosphere, uh, and again, the length KL. And this could be small or comparable to one, depending if, if you're talking about the atmosphere, for example, or the oceans. Now, the important thing for quasi-geostrophy is that you make this assumption, namely that the height of the layer that you're interested in divided by L is small compared to one. And of course, that's good for the ocean. For example, typical depth of the ocean is, say, four kilometers. Uh, these uh, meanders may be uh, 100 kilometers across. So H over L indeed is small. And that's the basic input that goes into quasi-geostrophic quasi approximation. Now, the consequence of this quasi-geostrophic approximation is that the motion is primarily horizontal. And you have hydrostatic balance in the vertical. And that's very restrictive, because you cannot using that kind of theory, describe convective phenomena. And convective phenomena are important in a variety of uh, uh, contexts in the atmosphere, for example, formation of cumulus clouds or the downwelling of the thermohaline uh, circulation in the Labrador Sea, things of that type. So what we want to do is we want to study structures that have significant vertical motions. And that means we have to relax uh, the, uh, uh, the conditions under which quasi-geostrophic approximation applies. So I'm going to be studying things like this. For example, I have a descending plume. This, like, this could be in the thermohaline circulation in the Labrador Sea. And it's descending. It's quite narrow in the horizontal direction, and it's extended in the vertical direction. Right? So it's a columnar structure. So the aspect ratio now is quite different from the previous pic picture. I have H over L comparable to 1 or greater than 1. Right? So these are going to be thin structures and tall in the vertical. But we're going to do the same kind of analysis that you use for quasi-geostrophy. So we're still going to assume that the Rossby number is small on these scales. And that's reasonable, actually, for this particular example, where the Rossby number is about 0.2. Uh, and again, we're going to uh, uh, have some kind of fruit number describing stratification. So these kinds of structures have been studied by many people. And I just want to show a couple of pictures from a very nice experiment by Sakai, published uh, already uh, 20 years ago. So I have, this is a side view of a rotating tank. It's rotating about the vertical direction. It's visualized through a suspension of liquid crystal. The liquid crystal has the unfortunate property that it turns red when the liquid is locally cold. Sorry about that. Uh, and it turns blue when it's warm, OK? So, uh, so these uh, red structures are not. Uh, uh, you know, hot descending plumes or something like that, they are actually uh, rising, um, excuse me, they are descending cold plumes. So, but this is a column, it's a vortex, and here is another uh, vertical structure that's rising because it's blue, it's warmer, right? So I have these structures that penetrate from uh, top to bottom and bottom to top. Uh, 
And this is what it looks like from above. You have a sea of these uh, vortices that just move around in an irregular fashion. And these structures are structures I'm going to be calling uh, Taylor columns because they extend all the way from the bottom to the top of the layer. So uh, what is it that I really want to do? Well, this is the, the basic parameter space for this kind of rotating convection problem or buoyancy-driven flow. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I have a measure of the rotation rate. Here I'm using the Taylor number. And on the vertical axis, I have the forcing of the flow measured by the Rayleigh number or the temperature difference that is applied across the system. Down here in this region, the Rayleigh number is not enough. So I have conduction. And then when I cross this uh, black line, convection sets in. And of course, convection is delayed over here because of the presence of rotation. Rotation is stabilizing. So I have to heat more in order to get convection. And I'm going to be interested in, in the region that's strongly affected by rotation. And that means that the so-called convective Rossby number is going to be substantially less than 1. And so that means if I calculate the Rossby number by calculating the typical velocity that's driven by buoyancy and use that to define the Rossby number, uh, then Rossby number 1 is along this dashed line. Rossby number 0 0.01 is along this line. I want to go into in this region. And of course, I have to heat more and more strongly in order to uh, get convection in the first place, right? So I'm going to be interested in the rapid rotation strong heating limit, right? That's this region here. Uh, Sakai's experiment barely get into this region. Uh, there are nice experiments by Peter Vorobiev and, and, um, and um, Bobeki. They also just barely get into the region. I want to go in this direction, but I'm not going to be able to do that numerically because as we've heard, under geophysical and astrophysical uh, conditions, the parameters are very extreme. Ekman numbers 10 to the minus 15, as we heard in the previous talk. So I want to take the primitive equations and I want to simplify them to be able to uh, treat these uh, inaccessible regions of the parameter space. Okay, that's the basic idea of this talk. So what are the basic equations? Well, here are the primitive equations. This is just the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, this is the Coriolis term. It's been written in terms of the Rossby number that we already saw. And uh, I, I did that by non-dimensionalizing the velocity in terms of some kind of char characteristic velocity scale, which is so far arbitrary. I'm just calling it u. And I have a characteristic length scale, l, as we saw in the previous pictures. And I use these parameters to non-dimensionalize non everything. And that introduces this uh, quantity 1 over R. Remember, I'm interested in low Rossby number. So this is going to be a, a large term. I'm also interested in situations uh, where viscosity is not so important. So that, you know, this is 1 over the, 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 the Reynolds number. So this is going to be a small term. Likewise, thermal diffusion is going to be a small term. So I have a, 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 you know, a, a numerical problem because I need to solve these equations. And I have these very small coefficients. And I have these very large coefficients. And how do I do that, right? So this is a problem because I need you know, tremendous spatial resolution. This is a problem because I need to track fast inertial waves. And I'm, I'm not interested in what the inertial waves are doing. I want to know what happens over longer time scales. So I want to get rid of these uh, uh, awkward parameters in order to be able to uh, treat this problem. And the way we do that is through an asymptotic expansion that simplifies the equations of motion. And this is the basic idea. So I'm going to do an expansion in the Rossby number. Remember, rapid rotations mean small Rossby number. So to remind me that the Rossby number is small, I'm going to call it epsilon. Right? Epsilon is always small. Uh, and uh, in order to make progress, I need to link the uh, horizontal length scale to the vertical length scale through and some kind of assumption that depends on epsilon. And the one that actually works is h over l is 1 over epsilon. Right? 1 over epsilon means that the horizontal scale is epsilon times the vertical scale. So that's exactly these columnar structures uh, that I showed you on the previous slides. OK? So once we decide this is a good thing to do, then we're going to do a multiscale expansion. Right? I'm not going to give details of how we do that. But the basic idea is that I'm going to rescale 
the horizontal uh, scales, x and y, th through this parameter 1 over epsilon. And of course, because it's going to be a three-dimensional flow, I also need a similar term for the vertical direction. But I'm driving the system over these very long scales in the vertical, right? Because my sc scales are small, and I'm imposing boundary conditions at top and bottom. So I also need a slow vertical scale, large vertical scale. That's cap called capital Z here. Right? So that's my spatial scaling, and then corresponding to that, there is some temporal scaling. And then I have to decide how strong are the fields that I want to study. And I've already said I want to look at non-hydrostatic motion, and that means I want substantial vertical velocities called W here. So I want to assume all of these are comparable in size. So I'm getting away from this hydrostatic assumption that's part of the QG uh, theory. Uh, I'm going to uh, divide the temperature into a horizontal average part and fluctuations, theta. And of course, I have to force the system strongly. So my forcing measured by this parameter gamma has to be big, 1 over epsilon. That's just to get convection going. The pressure, of course, is going to be large also. And that, if I put this into the equations, then at leading order, I get something I like, and that is I see that uh, from, I have a balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure. I have a, the flow is horizontally non-divergent. That means I can introduce a stream function, and the stream function is nothing but the pressure, right? This is the standard thing that you see in a weather map. It simply says that rather than the flow being, to, for example, uh, towards regions of low pressure, it goes around the region of low pressure uh, in a cyclonic fashion. Okay, so we know all about this. But now I want to get the evolution equation for psi, and I'll go to next order in my small parameter epsilon. And at that order, I get coupled equations for the vertical vorticity, omega, and the vertical velocity, w. Okay? So in this equation, I have an equation for omega. It's horizontally advected by uh, this uh, pressure field, if you like, psi. Uh, there's some F contribution from stretching in the vertical direction, some dissipation, right? I have an equation for the vertical velocity W. It's horizontally advected. This is nothing but the vertical pressure gradient. Remember, psi is P. I have some buoyancy forcing, and I have some dissipation, right? And then uh, that's still not enough because I don't have an equation for theta, so I have to go to yet further order in epsilon, and uh, that's why I'm not giving you details. And uh, then you find that theta is, again, horizontally advected. There is a contribution uh, to the thermal fluctuations from the vertical advection of the uh, uh, vertical gradient of the mean temperature, some thermal diffusion. And then th there's an equation for the evolution of this horizontally average temperature, which occurs on a slower time scale. Here is the vertical heat flux and some dissipation, okay? So those are the equations that I get. The nice thing about these is they are actually a closed set of equations, right? If you make other assumptions, you would not necessarily get closed equations. So I'm going to uh, rewrite them in a way maybe that makes them a little more familiar, and that is I'm going to make a choice of the horizontal scale L, and I'm gonna pick the scale that's predicted to be the one that first sets in, when I cross the threshold for convective instability. And that tells me that this uh, epsilon that I picked is actually Ekman number to the one third, okay? So here's the definition of the Ekman number. Ekman number is small when rotation is large, okay? And then also I'm going to pick a characteristic uh, velocity scale, the viscous scale, and then the equations look like the equations for rayleigh bernard convection, more or less, uh, here are the equations for the vertical um, uh, vorticity omega, equation for the vertical velocity. Here is the buoyancy term. Notice you have this combination of large RA, small e. I'm assuming this is of order one to drive turbulence. Uh, and then I have uh, an equation for the temperature fluctuation and for the evolution of the mean uh, temperature. And there is a new parameter that appears it's called sigma here, that's the Prandtl number, it's the ratio of the viscosity to thermal diffusivity, 
Um, I'm going to vary that parameter, but for water it's seven, for air it's roughly one. So that's typical values of, of, of sigma. The point about this is that there are no small or large parameters anymore, right? So these equations are easier to time step. That was the whole purpose of doing this calculation. And the same expansion also gives you boundary conditions. Turns out the boundary conditions are nice. They are free slip boundary conditions at top and bottom that are consistent with this asymptotic limit. And uh, the other thing I want to say about these equations is that they are quite interesting because they actually have two reflection symmetries. And so there's actually no asymmetry between cyclonic and anticyclonic motions in this rapid rotation limit. And so the first prediction I would make is that in that limit, you should see equal numbers of cyclonic and anticyclonic vortices. That's to be confirmed experimentally, perhaps, although there's some evidence that that is, in fact, the case. So what do these equations uh, show us? Well, here is a regime uh, diagram. Uh, so I'm showing here the Prandtl number. Seven, remember, is water. This is the forcing parameter, that combination of large RA, small e, small Ekman number. Um, and so I'm increasing that along this axis. And what you see here is that when I increase that parameter, I get uh, cellular convection first, that small combinations of, this, of these parameters. Then I get these Taylor columns that I showed you in the Sakai experiment. Eventually, when I force it too strongly, the Taylor columns start breaking up into plumes. That's what P stands for, OK? If I do it at lower frontal numbers, then the plumes come in almost immediately. The Taylor columns are presumably unstable. And then there is a transition, a gradual transition, into a state which we call geostrophic turbulence. So it's a turbulent three-dimensional state. But on all scales of the motion, I have geostrophic balance. That's the balance between the Coriolis terms and the pressure gradient, OK, on all scales. So it's not the usual kind of turbulence. <coughs> Sorry. Whoops, I'm going in the wrong direction here. I just want to show you uh, some pictures of what these states look like. So on the left, I have frontal number seven. I'm increasing the Rayleigh number going in this direction. These are the Taylor columns. Here are the plumes. They detach from the top boundary, for example, the cold plumes, and start descending but they no longer make, make it all the way through, OK? So I'm calling them plumes. Likewise, I have hot plumes that detach from the bottom. They start rising, don't make it all the way, OK? So that's the plume regime. Here is the corresponding thing for a particular choice of this parameter, RA, varying the frontal number. And when the frontal number is large, let, well, of comparable to water, I have these Taylor columns. Then I go into the plume regime, and this state up here at low frontal number is the geostrophic turbulence regime. So this is just a, a snapshot of what that would look like. This is a periodic uh, box computation in three dimensions. Uh, it's a little bit fuzzy, and that's deliberate, because this is for sigma is 0.3. So thermal diffusion is stronger than viscosity. And so the thermal field is a little bit uh, uh, fuzzier than the velocity field would be. Um, so there are some uh, nice uh, things I can uh, tell you about the properties of this equation. So if, if you take the equation for the temperature fluctuation, multiply by theta integrate over the domain, you get a nice integral relation. If you look at the saturated steady state, the stationary state of the turbulence, you can integrate the equation for the mean temperature. And then you get uh, the equations shown here. There's just a quadratic equation. You can solve it for the. Um, a gradient of the mean temperature, and you get a nice equation. And when this factor vanishes, that represents the boundary between the thermal boundary layer near the top and bottom of the, of, of the cell and the bulk. So we use that to characterize what we mean by the thermal boundary layers, which are still in the system. They get thinner as the Rayleigh number increases. Uh, and the bulk region, which is outside of these thermal boundary layers. And the transition is uh, basically when uh, you know, the bulk and the boundary layers carry half the heat flux measured here by the Nusselt number. So uh, what about these boundary layers? The boundary layers are important because uh, as I increase the Rayleigh number, uh, they first lose stability when I'm still 
not very close to isothermal in the core. So this is height, this is temperature. Uh, the boundary layers become unstable here, become unstable here. And so that when I have a state that looks something like this at a larger value of the Rayleigh number, these boundary layers are unstable, but the core is actually stable, right? It's very opposite to standard non-rotating Rayleigh Bernard convection. And this just shows the eigenmodes of the boundary layer instability, just to convince you that that really happens. And so we'd like to know something about the boundary layers, because it's the boundary layers that are going to actually um, be very important in the, in, in, this, uh, uh, in the rest of this talk. So we assume that when we have large values of this parameter, so in some kind of asymptotic turbulence regime, uh, all the quantities um, in the problem scale with some powers of this parameter capital R, right? So that's the horizontal scales. This is the magnitude of the stream function and so on, okay? And then we look uh, at what happens when R goes to infinity. Of course, we can't do that numerically, but we look at large values of R and we want to see if there are any terms that drop out of our reduced equations. And we find that in the boundary layers, they all remain roughly over the same order of magnitude. And therefore, we must have some relations between these exponents, right? And when we uh, put all this together, for example, this is the Nusselt number here, goes like R to the eta minus delta. And if I take this expression for, 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 for delta and for eta here, I see that the Nusselt number has to go like R to this power of 4s minus 1. Okay, and so we'd like to check whether this, in fact, is reasonable and perhaps use numerics to determine S or use theory to determine S. And so here is the uh, numerics. So this is a compensated plot of the Nusselt number, um, and we see that when uh, the exponent is R to the minus 3 halves, uh, these curves level off as I increase R, and therefore that the appropriate power is uh, Nussel goes like R to the 3 halves, okay? And this shows uh, the different numbers for the different um, uh, leveling off uh, for different frontal numbers. For the larger frontal numbers, it hasn't leveled off, and that's because I haven't reached this geostrophic turbulence regime. I would have to increase R even more, presumably, to reach that state. So we get this prediction uh, by matching the numerics to the previous theory, and we also have an independent way of, uh, of getting this uh, result. We assume that the Nusselt number goes like some power of, of, of Rayleigh times Ekman number to another power. This has been, this kind of relation has been studied extensively when there's no rotation, so beta is zero. Um, in the case of rapid rotation, the situation is very different from the non-rotating non case, and that's because the temperature gradient at mid-height does not saturate as I increase Ra. In fact, what happens is that's because of rotation, and so that the bulk of the, of the layer controls the heat flux. In non-rotating Rayleigh Bernard convection, the flux is controlled by the boundary layers, the ability of the boundary layers to transport heat. So this is very different. And then if we do use a Kolmogorov type argument, saying that when R is large, um, the transport properties must be independent of the uh, microscopic diffusion coefficients, uh, it turns out we get a prediction exactly like this, which is what we saw in the numerical um, computation. So that's consistent, that's nice. Uh, and this is just to convince you that what I've just said is correct. So this shows the mean temperature, uh, mid-level temperature gradient as a function of this parameter r. And you see, for example, when I'm in the geostrophic regime, that gradient just saturates, right? It doesn't come closer and closer to isothermal. And this just shows that the the bulk does, in fact, contribute most of the heat flux. The boundary layers are insignificant. And this is just to convince you that the scaling for the temperature fluctuation for the vertical velocity that we get from that theory are really obeyed in the numerical simulations. Um, here, I'm just showing what happens as I vary the rotation rate. So this is the Nusselt number versus Rayleigh number. This is the non-rotating. Uh, uh, curve that's been studied as I increase rotation, uh, this thing peels off with different rates as the rotation rate increases. I don't have time to discuss that figure in more detail. So the last thing I want to say uh, is tell you about is the instability of this geostrophic turbulence. Uh, we discovered this um, serendipitously 
uh, we integrated the equations and we found that things weren't quite saturating. There was a drift. And when we looked at the data, it's always a good idea to look at your data, uh, we discovered the formation of these uh, large structures that emerge out of uh, the uh, turbulent state. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this is uh, what it looks like. So I start with some random initial conditions. I settle towards the saturated state. Here is the drift I was describing. So, and we saw that this drift had to do with, as a function of time, the evolution of these large-scale structures. And this shows uh, the uh, kinetic energy in the three-dimensional fluctuations. I'm going to call those the baroclinic mode or baroclinic state. And this shows the energy in a barotropic state, that's a vertically in, you know, um, integrated state uh, that doesn't have um, a vertical structure. And you can see that the energy of that state increases continuously as these vortices grow. So this is what they look like, like the, the turbulent structures that live on top of this turbulent state. And uh, here you can see them penetrating all the way across. So these are the kind of things I'm talking about. Here again is another picture that shows this in a, in a, in a, in a different way, right? So, so this is an example. I just want to compare, compare this with some of the other talks we've heard uh, today. We're not talking about small vortices combining into larger vortices, larger vortices combining into yet larger vortices. This is not 2D, right? This is not 2D hydrodynamics. This is fully 3D, and the energy goes directly from small scales into the largest available scale in the system. And the way that happens is that you align the phases of the small scale modes, and then the small scale modes interact, and they can put energy directly into the large scale mode, right? That's the example of uh, spectral condensation that somebody uh, mentioned uh, also uh, today. So here are the spectra that you get. So these are the baroclinic states, uh, three dimensional uh, fluctuations. They have a more or less Kolmogorov spectrum. This is the the barotropic contribution. So this is the entropy cascade that we've been talking about. There's a turnoff over here, but as a function of time, the turnoff gets contaminated by these large-scale vortices. And this k to the minus 3 spectrum is a signature of the large-scale vortices. So that's uh, um, what the spectral picture looks like. This is what it looks like in time. I start with some uh, uh, different modes. Um, so this is the baroclinic state. You see the energy in the baroclinic state hardly varies. Uh, the solid line is the largest available barotropic mode that fills the box, right? That's the vortex mode. And you can see that initially it does nothing, but then it just takes off and, and dominates everything as time increases. And that's the spectral condensation that we've been talking about, okay? So how do we uh, quantify this? I just have a couple more slides. Is that OK? Um, uh, so we're going to take the vorticity and the stream function, and we're going to divide it into a barotropic component that's vertically averaged. So that's two-dimensional. And then I have a three-dimensional fluctuation. That's the baroclinic uh, uh, component, OK? So this is standard barotropic, baroclinic uh, 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 decomposition. And then I can get equations for the barotropic part that's the 2D part, except that there is forcing from the fluctuations, the 3D fluctuations. If I had, didn't have the 3D fluctuations, this would just be 2D Euler or, or 2D hydrodynamics, and I would have the usual you know, inverse energy cascade with vortices combining into bigger vortices, dot, 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 right? This is different because of this term, and this term it, you know, is computed from the equation for the fluctuations, the baroclinic. Uh, uh, contribution, right? So that's one way of thinking, thinking about it. Or you can look at the same thing in terms of what happens in Fourier space. And maybe that's more familiar to people here. And then I can get an equation for the energy in the barotropic component. So rate of change of the energy, well, there's a contribution from barotropic, barotropic interaction. There's a contribution from baroclinic, barotropic contribution. That's these fluctuations. And then there is some dissipation, right? And so these transfer rates can be computed from our simulations. And uh, I think the next picture shows what that looks like. So here, here is the uh, FK. That's the baroclinic contribution to the barotropic mode. And you can see as a function of time from region 1 to region 2 to region 3, 
the peak of that contribution, I'm summing over all the baroclinic modes horizontally, that peak moves towards k equals zero, and that's because you're putting all the energy from the small scales into the large scales, right? There's no intervening cascade of vortices. There's no, you know, there's no inverse energy cascade as such. So that's uh, this. So let me just conclude now by mentioning that um, uh, since we did this work, um, uh, the people have solved uh, primitive equations for actually very low Ekman number, like 10 to the minus 7. That was done by Stefan Stelmach in Münster. And he found qualitatively a similar sequence of transitions. This is a side view. This is a top view uh, here. He has cellular convection. These are the Taylor columns that I showed you. This is what it looks like from above, like in the experiment of Sakai. Then he has the plume regime, uh, where the Taylor um, columns break down. And then finally, he gets something like the geostrophic turbulence. And if I translate his parameter values into my combination of parameters, this Ekman to the four-thirds times Rayleigh, you see that it's spanning the same more or less the same uh, uh, parameter regime that I've been talking about all along. So I, I think that's interesting because, you know, the theory was designed to take these e extreme limits to get to geophysically or astrophysically relevant regimes. Uh, this is not 10 to the minus 15, but it still seems to, uh, seems to more or less work. So I call this the unreasonable effectiveness of asymptotics. It's a good thing that happens, right? So here are my uh, conclusions. I showed you that um, these reduced equations um, are useful because they can be integrated and they describe what happens in these extreme parameter regimes. I uh, showed you, for example, that the Nuttall number scales with the Rayleigh number in this fashion, including the Prandtl number dependence and the rotation rate dependence. And I showed you that the scaling had to do with the fact that the, the bulk of the convection outside of the thermal boundary layers was the thing that was limiting the efficiency of heat flux transport through the layer. Uh, I showed you that geostrophic turbulence was unstable uh, to these large-scale barotropic modes that evolved directly uh, from the turbulent state. Um, and uh, I showed you the, the barotropic baroclinic uh, spectra um, and including the signature of these uh, vortices at large scales. And uh, finally, I think I have a couple of references to, uh, to uh, the more recent work uh, by Favier et al. and Gervilli et al., where uh, the primitive equations have been solved, and these large-scale vortex structures have also been uh, detected. And so there are some references in case people are interested in more details. Thank you very much.